Hello and welcome back to the Karma Stories Podcast. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today I have four stories for you from the Pro Revenge subreddit. The Karma Stories Podcast is published to all major podcasting platforms and you can also read along on YouTube under our at Karma Stories Podcast handle. If you have a story you'd like to submit to the podcast, you can do so by email at karmastoriespod at gmail.com. All right, on to today's stories. Let's get our revenge on. This story comes to us from JoyPill15. I was a crappy customer to our crappy customer. I used to work a customer service job at a dispensary. We had this one customer who was just a cranky, miserable woman. She'd come in acting all sweet, say hi to us all, ask for her product, and then the show would begin. Here's an example of how these transactions typically went. This isn't what I ordered. Go get what I ordered. Ma'am, you specifically requested this eighth. You said you wanted 3.5 grams of brownie scout. No, I said I wanted the pineapple gummies. Go get them now. We would go get the things she said she wanted. She'd complain about lazy employees, be all smiles again, and then she would pay and leave and be right back in the store in a half hour later with any excuse she could think of. The package was open when she got it. The edibles melted together. There was a hair in her jar. The packaging smelled like chlorine. Any stupid excuse she could pull from her butt, looking for a refund or store credit, she would try and use it. Every single time she came in, this is how it went. But then one day, I went to a gas station to fill up my car while I was in the next town over. And wouldn't you be darned, she was a cashier at the gas station. So I of course asked for a pack of Marvel 100s. She grabbed the pack and I said, that's not what I asked for, I asked for the camels. She grabbed the camels. Um, that's not what I wanted, I wanted the Newports. She sighed and grabbed the Newports. What are you doing, I'm just in here to pay for my gas. The long stare she gave me was almost enough to make me regret starting crap but she knew, as an employee, she could get in real trouble if she snapped. So she forced a smile, put my cash in the register, and I went on my merry way. But I wasn't done. I came right back in five minutes later. I looked at her and said, Excuse me, I only spent X amount on gas, but you took all of my money. Where's my change? She is obviously super pissed off at this point, but what was she going to do about it? That's effing right, absolutely nothing. So she tries very hard and fails to politely explain to me that the gas cost the amount I had given her and she couldn't give me the difference. So in a voice that almost sounded exactly like hers, I complained about lazy employees, smiled sweetly, said goodbye, and walked out, just like she does. She didn't learn her lesson for a while, came back in a few times with her same old routine, then I recruited a coworker and we both went back to that gas station separately a few times and did our new routine. After trying and failing to file a complaint, she stopped coming in entirely, and balance was finally restored. I don't work at the dispensary anymore, but traumatizing her the way she did my coworkers and I still makes me smile years later. Laugh out loud. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called clevergirl2013. It says... That is the best way to deal with people like that. How could she be so bad when she works in customer service herself? OP responded and said, You'd think she'd have a little more self-awareness, especially since her incessant bickering and whining could mean she could be at the register anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes. On our short staff days, we'd begin sweating while she whined because we had to idly stand by and suffer in silence as we watched the queue get bigger and not moving at all. Another commenter down below called Fun Grapefruit 2633 said, The manager of the dispensary is the real villain here. He or she should have administered a culture where the employees can say, Hey, this lady shells out abuse every time. What should we do? The manager should have had a talk with that customer and either handled her himself from then on or told her she couldn't come back. He should not have his employees accept any kind of abuse from customers. OP responded to this one and said, Yeah, dispensary managers aren't much different from the employees. They too are stoners. And from my experience, most stoners are really bad at being assertive. And my manager was a people pleaser. He did not like doing anything that would risk getting yelled at from the district manager. 
Well, OP to me, that means that the district manager is a bit of a dick too and doesn't know how to do their job properly if they're just coming in and yelling at your boss for taking care of a really pain in the butt customer. I thought it was pretty awesome that you were able to get one of your coworkers to go over and do it with you. Kind of wish it had been more, but at least having an accomplice with you made things a little bit better. Our next story is along the same lines and actually comes from a comment under the first story. It's from a user called Tony Snark 81. It says, years ago, I managed a blockbuster video. I had a regular who went out of his way to antagonize me anytime he came in, simply because I wouldn't, couldn't refund a $1.25 late fee to his account. For months, every time he came in, he would call me names, do his best to get under my skin, and in one memorable visit, actually try to physically intimidate me by pretending to come across a counter at me. When I didn't react even a little, he got more mad. One day, my buddy and I decided we wanted to try this new sandwich place a few blocks from my store. We walked in, and behind the counter, guess who? My butthole customer. I told my buddy to just play along, and away we went. I asked question after stupid question, being as borderline belligerent as possible. Eventually, he recognized me and started to become belligerent himself. I immediately went into victim mode, pretending I didn't know who he was, and not at all understanding why he was being so mean to me. My buddy, wearing slacks and a button-down shirt, comes up, tells me he's a lawyer, and if I'd like to file a complaint, he'd be more than happy to stand witness. At that point, a woman walks out of the kitchen, starts screaming at the guy in a different language, and quickly chased him into the kitchen. She tried to make nice, but with him in the kitchen, there was no way we were going to eat there, and we said so. We left, then went home, and laughed our butts off. I found out a few days later that the woman was his wife, and she kicked his butt for being rude to yet another customer, and that he was known for having an incredibly short temper. He came in a few days later to close his account, saying he was going to Hollywood Video because they understand good customer service. As soon as he left, my associates and I started laughing because Hollywood Video had been shutting down locations for months and had already announced plans to shut their remaining locations. I never saw him again, thankfully. OP, your buddy did a wonderful job of playing along without any context going into the situation. That was very well done. Remembering what the commenter said from the first story about the manager not really doing their job in handling this customer, well, I thought that would apply to this second one, but then I realized that this story comes from the point of view of the manager, and they apparently just let the customer keep on coming in and calling them names at the cash register over and over. I think there should have been something in place to tell that customer, hey, you can't come back anymore and do that. Like, I don't even believe in three strikes at this point. If you come in and you're belligerent to an employee, you should get banned from the store. That's just the way it should be. This story comes to us from Seagull Fan Club. Ew. Tricking my slacker coworker into sabotaging himself. I work in an office with a guy I'll call Seth. Seth is that coworker that everyone knows. Lazy, always passing his work on to someone else, and somehow always getting away with it. He'll sit around on his phone or go to the bathroom every 10 minutes. He's the kind of guy who will show up late, make some lame excuse about traffic, and then disappear for lunch for two hours. For the past six months, Seth's favorite target has been me. He'll send emails asking if I can help out with the project, but what he really means is do all the work while I take the credit. I complained to my boss a couple of times, but somehow Seth always managed to weasel his way out of trouble. The final straw came when he passed off a major report that was due to a client in two days, dumping it on me last minute. One day, I casually asked him if he was good with Excel, and he admitted he didn't know much about it. Perfect. The next time Seth tried to dump a bunch of spreadsheets on me to organize for his next report, I agreed. But this time, I embedded a series of hidden formulas into the document. These formulas didn't do anything important, just enough to mess with the numbers if someone didn't know how to check for hidden cells. It took me a little time, but I was careful not to make it too obvious. The kicker? Every time Seth tried to copy and paste the data into his report, it would scramble everything just enough to be completely useless. 
on the day the report was due, Seth slacked off like usual, assuming I had handled it like always. When the client called, furious, because the report was filled with nonsense numbers, Seth panicked. He rushed to fix it, but every time he tried to fix one part of the report, something else would break. He came to me frantic and asked for help. I acted confused and said, Oh, I don't know what happened. Maybe it's a glitch. I gave him some vague advice and watched as he spent the entire day trying to salvage his mess. Our boss found out, and for once, Seth couldn't talk his way out of it. He got lambasted for screwing up such an important project and was put on temporary leave without pay. I guess he'll be doing his own work from now on. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Medic Jambi. It says, Perhaps every time you're asked, shoot your manager an email saying that you're happy to help, but you're asking the manager what other projects he or she wants you to delay to work on your coworker's project. Another commenter down below called Ver Wilder said, If he's just a coworker, why even bother agreeing to his request for help? Just tell him to pound sand. OP responded to this one and said, I'm newer than him and wanted to be nice at first, but it became too much. That's why I decided to play along until I could think of a way to get back. I think the biggest lesson that comes out of this story is that we need to learn to say no to people when they try to pawn off their work onto us. This is especially important if you are brand new in a workplace because if you let it be known that you're willing to take other people's work right away, well, that's going to be your job from now on. I mean, if it's a manager, obviously you're going to do what they say, but if it's a coworker at the same level as you, at the bare minimum you need to question what's going on and definitely sometimes say no way. This story comes to us from Living Bunch 6371 They kicked out my sister-in-law when she came out, so I forced them to sell the same house. My sister-in-law came out as a trans woman when she was 18. My wonderful in-laws kicked her out of the house then and there. They told her to leave the house and threw her out at 8 p.m. with no money or even any documents, and her father took the car keys from her too. She had to walk eight miles to get to our place. She was crying, and we took her in. This is horrible behavior, but my husband and I would have just cut them off if it was all they did, but they doubled down. They refused to hand over any of the documents, and my brother-in-law had to go over and barge into their house to get them. They also cleaned up all the money in a joint account. She had saved up $8,000 working part-time all through high school. They took the money and also sold her car, which was in their name. They were trying to ruin her life as much as they could. My father-in-law is a small-time businessman, and his biggest account was supplying my employer. I had helped him get the contract, and it was very lucrative for him. My employer was a family business, and they treated long-term employees more like family than as employees. I was talking to my boss about what happened. He told me that if I could find someone within 5% range of the price my father-in-law offered, they would make the switch. My father-in-law offered us really great rates. He was very good at his job, but he had effed up the contract because even though we always bought from him, we weren't obligated to buy from him. We could switch suppliers anytime, but he got complacent and assumed we wouldn't switch suppliers. It took me six months of painful searching to find a supplier who could replace him and get us great rates. This was not a major part of my duties, and I had to put in way more hours than normal to find the darn supplier, but when I did find them, I waited for a month before informing my boss. See, my in-laws had been planning to do a major renovation for a long time, and it involved tearing down a major portion of their house. I waited until the renovation work had truly started before informing my boss. We started to get supplies from the new supplier the next month itself. It crushed his business. It effed his unit economics, and he had to scramble to find new customers. They ended up having to sell their house to save the business, and they didn't get a good rate for it because the house was, well, half torn down when they sold it. My in-laws did try to get money from my brother-in-law, but he told them to F off. My father-in-law is a decent businessman, and he did crawl his way out of the hole they dug for themselves, but even eight years later, they still haven't bought a new house. I've heard they're still sour about what happened. I mean, I was just doing my job, and if they had just kicked her out, 
they would still have the house. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Big Bad Boogeyman. It says, As a father, I really don't understand how you can suddenly be so awful to your child after they tell you something that is completely out of their control. How does that even work? Do you instantly stop loving them? Another commenter below called Canna Banana List said, I heard it echoed, but as a parent, there is nothing my kids could do that would make me not love them and want to be part of their lives. Being a parent isn't always about agreeing with your kids. It's doing what's best for them until they can make decisions for themselves. Kicking out and then trying to punish the same babies I carried and snuggled and giggled with for something as trivial as not approving of how they want to live their lives when they aren't hurting anyone is selfishly barbaric. OP, I'm extremely glad that your sister-in-law had you to go to, to stay with, and to help with this transition. Your sister-in-law really should be in therapy though if they're not already because having your parents kick you out is something that stays with you and you need to work through it. And I have to agree with the commenter that I have no idea how a parent can have that much hate towards one of their own children. If you enjoy daily Reddit stories, I encourage you to follow and add us to your favorites on whichever podcasting platform you enjoy the most. And if you're watching and listening on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and drop a like on the video. It really helps us out. I thank you for watching and listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.